the answer to all of my questions. I found it to be uh, the truth, right? Uh, and the standard for the truth. Uh, I've wrestled with it. Anybody ever wrestle with scripture? We wrestle with it a little bit. I've wrestled with it. Uh, fought with it. I realized that I couldn't box God. My arms were too short. <laughs> So then he had to be true. So then if there was something, and, and here's something I, I want to give you. If there's ever a moment where it seems like the Bible could be contradicting itself, I've learned enough to know that the issue isn't in the Bible. The issue is in my understanding. Especially when it comes to who, what, where, why, to whom this, the, the verses are being given, all those kind of things, okay? And when you put all that together and then you go back and balance it out, you find out, okay, it's saying this here and saying that there because of a particular reason. But then as you get a little, uh, how should I put this? You begin to trust God a little bit more in reading scripture. You begin to understand that you're reading in faith reading in faith, believing that the Holy Spirit is there with you, helping you to understand that there is not something that is trying to stop you from understanding other than distractions or anything else, but the Holy Spirit is there to help you to understand. Amen? Amen. And so in 2 Timothy, yeah, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, here's what the Bible says. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. All right. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for what you're going to show us and what you're going to uh, reveal to us. Lord, I thank you for the anticipation for your word, the anticipation for your revelation knowledge. I thank you that you would lead and guide us into all truth, Lord, that you reveal mysteries to us, that you reveal yourself to us that much more, Lord. We come to Bible study tonight to learn more about you, to see you better. Help us to focus on you, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you would be in the details, Lord, that you'll be in the spaces between the words and between the phrases, Lord. We thank you for your Holy Spirit leading us and guiding us through your word tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. So, so here's a question. As we go in, as we continue the series, as we came off of uh, the mental health series, we get back into God questions. And so I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions tonight. Will, are you ready for that? Yeah. Ask you a bunch of questions tonight. And I'm wanting you to answer. Most of these are not going to be rhetorical. <laughs> so here's the question. Here's the first one. Why is knowing and understanding the word important? Why is knowing and understanding the word important? It's the only way to Christ. It's the only way to Christ. Through the word, right? I know a, 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 a church in uh, around Chester, I think it's in Delaware, called Through the Word, Through the World Bible Fellowship. They believe in the word, okay? <laughs> Through the word Bible Fellowship. They believe in the word. Why? Why is knowing the scripture important. Knowing and understanding important. Because if you don't know it, you can't live it and you can't teach it. If you don't know it, you can't live it. Definitely can't teach it. And if we're going to be followers of Christ, then we have to be lovers of the word. Those two things have to come together. Amen? Amen. One more. <laughs> okay. It's our life. It's our life. It's our very being. Yeah, so it's it's that essential. Yeah, it's it's kind of like what uh, Peter said to Christ, right? Are you leaving also? Well, where would we go? You have the words of life. Where are we going to go to, right? And so that's how it becomes that important. In in Second Timothy chapter three, it, it talked about how all scripture, but all scripture is one. It is given, right? Have you thought about the Bible that you have, the the word that you have as a gift? thought about it like that, is given, and is given by inspiration of God, right? Now, we might have to wrestle with it. 
there are some scriptures that are in there that anybody ever come across a scripture that you didn't like? Just me? No. No. <laughs> Remember, you don't want you don't want to throw your seasoning in that. You don't want to stick your foot in that one. A scripture you just didn't like it. I just did. I don't like it. But it's true. But I don't like it. Right? But now I got to live it, even though I don't like it, which means now you got to wrestle with that, right? Elderly. Now, what does that remind you of? What does that bring into your, your mind? Wrestling with the particular scripture, wrestling with the word. What does that, what does that make you think of? Jacob. Jacob. That's somebody reading their Bible. <laughs> Jacob wrestling with the angel of the Lord, but we understand the angel of the Lord to be the pre incarnate Christ. We're going to jump to some good stuff tonight. <laughs> wrestling with, and what does he say? I'm not going to let you go till you. What if you treated the word that way? Even the scripture you don't like. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. A lot of people get frustrated with the word and they put it down and say, I can't understand it. I challenge you to wrestle with it. Wrestle with it. If you don't understand it, it's grabbing you this way and tossing you that way and throwing you down and get back up and wrestle it again. Right? I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Go to John 5. John chapter 5 and verse 39. Some of these I've already written down, and I'm going to say them quicker than you get to them, all right? But uh, that, that's, how we're going to, that's how we're going to get to there. John chapter 5 and verse 39, here's another reason why the scripture becomes important. Jesus said this, and I've read this again and again in Bible study. I'm going to keep on reading it till it's way down in your soul. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. He was talking to the, uh, the, the saints at the time and saying, uh, uh, or the Jews at the time and saying that you, by you looking in scripture, you think by just having it that you have eternal life. If you can just memorize more scripture. But he's saying it's not the scripture that has eternal life. What it is, is me. They testify of me, but it's me who has the eternal life. That means now we've got to separate something that seems like it can't be separated. And that is, here's my Bible, but my Bible is not Christ. But Christ is the Word. Mm -hmm. So the Scripture tells us about the Word. But the Word is a who. So the Scripture tells us about Jesus. Jesus is the one that has eternal life. You ever talk to somebody who says they don't believe the Bible and they say the reason why they don't believe the Bible because they read it from beginning to end? Oh, I read the Bible. Anybody ever talk to somebody like that? I read the Bible. I read the whole thing. To me, if you read the whole thing from beginning to end and it didn't change your heart at all, maybe, maybe, maybe you read it in a way that you shouldn't have. Sometimes we've got to keep reading scripture until the scripture turned around and starts reading us. But if I read the scripture only for information, because I'm gathering information, right? Well, the scripture will do this. The scripture should be like a mirror to you, right? Like the bronze lover. Come on, tabernacle people. The bronze lover with the water in it, you, you look over in it and you see yourself. The scripture becomes a mirror to yourself. That's what happens when we read the Old Testament. It becomes a mirror putting on all the blemishes. Then we go to the New Testament to clean it up. <laughs> right? Okay, so then this is what Jesus is saying. It says, I, internal life is in me, but the scriptures talk about me, right? So then the word of God becomes paramount, and to neglect your studies is to neglect your growth in Christ. To neglect our studies is to neglect our growth in Christ. That means this. You know what it looks like? It looks like maybe you got to get up. You get up and you go uh, get ready to go to work, and you got so much time that you know you need. I don't know. Let, let's call it out. Let's see how much time you need from the moment you get up to leaving out the door. How much time you need to, to get ready? Forty minutes. Fifteen minutes, an hour. Anybody bigger than an hour? Hour going once, going twice. Hour forty-five. One hour, one hour and done. 
Anybody better than 15 minutes? Can you get anybody better than 15 yeah, minutes? That's, that's Can you beat Sky in 15 you. minutes? I'm, I'm not happily leaving. Oh, you're not happily leaving. This is like when you got to make it happen 15 minutes. <laughs> Merv? I thought you were right. I thought you were pretty, you know. You know. <laughs> Let me catch you on one of these questions, man. All right. So then now, but that means if you take an hour and you know you need an hour, then to, then to grow in Christ means that you do another hour, that you set your alarm clock an hour ahead. Because you're committed to growing in Christ. And if an hour ahead is too much for you right now, 30 minutes will do. If 30 minutes is too much, 15 minutes will do. Because it's not about how long, it's about how consistent. How consistent. Everybody say consistent. consistent. How consistent can you be? Can you give 10 minutes per day systematically without fail for 30 days? If you can do that, I guarantee you, somewhere in there, the Holy Spirit will meet you and the 10 minutes will be up and you'll keep going. 10 becomes 15, 15 becomes 30 minutes. Now you're like Sky because now you got to get ready in 15 minutes because you didn't get up early enough. So now you got to start getting up early. I got What happened for me is I started getting up two and three hours early because it was this feeding that was going on that I didn't know what it was for. For me, I didn't know what it was for. I realized it now, but I didn't know what it was for uh, then. I was just happy to get revelation. God, would if you want to give it to me, I'll write it down. And that was before having laptops and all that kind of stuff. Because I just had books. Just books. So I had a big concordance that was out that had all the different words, had all the thes. You understand what I mean? All of the is were, were in there. And and that was the, that was Google. Turning and looking for a scripture. And, Y'all ain't never looked for a scripture until all you had was your concordance in the back of your, all right? And, and for, for those of you who know what I'm talking about, your lexicon. You had your lexicon and your concordance. You ain't never looked for a scripture unless you had one of them. But now, we're going to embrace technology. Praise God. Jump on BibleGateway.com. Yep, we're going to jump on BibleHub.com. And when that fails... And then you jump in Google and still you can get uh, right there. All right? So thank God, thank God for that. And you're going to need some of that uh, as, as we go along. All right? Okay. So here's what God questions is going to be about. This is going to be the next stage of it. It's going to be about getting after understanding and meaning. Meaning. Really digging into those scriptures and asking questions. And that's why I put on there God questions. Because a lot of times I'm looking at scripture. It is not the answer that you're trying to get to. It's asking the right question. If you can ask the right question, it will provoke the right kind of learning. The Holy Spirit will pour right into it. You learn to ask the right question. Look at somebody and say, got questions. Got questions. Got questions. You got to learn to ask the right question. So, take a look at uh, Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 7, which we have right here so uh, according to that scripture it says wisdom is the what principle. principle some of you got this one memorized already wisdom is the principal thing therefore I wrote this a little close so forgive me therefore get wisdom, wisdom. alright get wisdom wisdom is the know how right knowledge with know how now you got wisdom so this is why, you know, when you're, look, when you're looking in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and you're looking at the gifts of the Spirit, right? <laughs> it's so serious. You're looking at the gifts of the Spirit and it says word of knowledge. It says word of wisdom. Then it says gift of prophecy, right? Now sometimes I'm going to splinter off and we're just going to deal with some things. But word of knowledge, if the Holy Spirit gave me a word of knowledge uh, for you, I release, right? That, that is going to be something that you know, and I don't know, but the Spirit knows, but it's to provoke your attention. It may not be about that particular word, but it may, it may be about the next thing the Holy Spirit's going to say. All right, everybody got that? Then you got the word of wisdom. The word of wisdom 
it would seem like you got a word of knowledge and now you got a word of wisdom. Well, isn't that the same thing? But a word of knowledge is about something that you know. But a word of wisdom, what do you think a word of wisdom is? Is that the application of what you know? So the word of wisdom becomes something to do, something to apply, to take what that is and then put it to work, right? Now, then the gift of prophecy, pro let me help everybody just for a second. If what happens is a man or woman of God gets in front of an audience and they are reading everybody's mail, Everybody understand what I mean? Reading everybody's mail and they're calling out names and addresses. And first of all, you call out names and addresses. There is a slight possibility that because you registered online. All right, no. Okay, so I'm going to let that go. <laughs> Just throw that one out there. Okay. But there are some uh, prophets, men and women of God, that do just that, and it is really what it is, right? Um, and and then a, a, a vision will come, and they'll see straight into, you know. But here's the thing. But God, God is a gentleman. So a word of knowledge isn't going to come. Understand the gifts of the Spirit in the New Testament are for exhortation, edification, coming through love. You understand? And if it's not walking through the office of the prophet, it's for those things. It's to build you up. So the word of knowledge isn't going to come. You, you know, I'm going to grab you because I just, you know. Why not? The word of knowledge isn't going to come in front of everybody and talk about God sees your illicit affair. In front. That's right. Not. Right? That's how we get a fence going. Mm -hmm. Okay? I'm, the reason why I'm saying that is because if, if I, as a man of God, stand before you in his word of knowledge, word of knowledge, word of knowledge, there's nothing wrong with that. But then if we leave and we said the, the prophet spoke, mm -hmm. no. Because prophecy is about what's going to happen. Prophecy is always about what's going to happen. But all of those things can work together. Where there's a word of knowledge and then a word of wisdom and a gift of prophecy and then laying hands and then you're healed from something. All of that can work all together based on however the Holy Spirit wants to move. Everybody understand that? Okay. So then, when it says here, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, the application of knowledge. And in... All and in all your what? Getting. getting and all your getting and all that getting get what? Understanding. Understanding. And that's what we're after. That's what we're after uh, through God questions is meaning and understanding. Right? Okay. That's Proverbs four and seven. So here's some um, here's some some practice. We're gonna do some of this uh, tonight. I'm gonna kind of walk you through it. All right. And don't leave before you get this little piece of homework here. All right, I'm going to show you how this is going to work. You're going to uh, uh, love it. You're going to love it. <laughs> so let's go to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17. Uh, and if we get all the way through, wow. If we get all the way through this one, it'll be, it'll be a blessing to you. Matthew 17. We're going to look at some of the words of Christ in, in the gospel. Um, and we're going, to, we're going to see something. Oh, my goodness. We're going to see something awesome. There's another scripture I don't have up here. It is Luke 17. Luke 17, verses 20 to 30. But you can just write Luke 17 for right now. Matthew 17 and verse 1. It says, Now after six days, Jesus took who? Peter, James, Peter, James and John, his, his, his brother, uh, uh, led them up. Excuse me. Let, me. let me read this again. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, uh, led them up on a high mountain by themselves. Verse 2. And he was what? He was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them talking with him. 
Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make here three what? Tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Very important. And then verse 5, while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Hear him. This is one of the most powerful manifestations of Christ on the earth. Or I could say, not on the earth. Right? Because for a moment, he leaves the earth. He is transfigured. He is moved into glory. Right? I, I, I don't want to say that he was levitating. I, I don't really like saying it like that. But he was caught up into glory from the earth. And in that moment, glorified. And when he's glorified, he's glorified with Moses and Elijah. But let me, let me tell you how I would look at this. Because it becomes about the question. So go back to Matthew 17, looking in verse 1 again, and it says, Now after six days, and they're going up on the mountain. He's taking Peter, James, and John, right? The question, the question becomes important. Just looking in verse 1. What's a good question? Good! Now after six days. Now if you say six days, now you, it forces you to go back. And when you go back, you find out something else, right? Great question. What's another question? Why Peter, Why Peter, James, and John? Why not Nathaniel, Bartholomew, and, oh no, it's Nathaniel, Bartholomew. Why not Philip? Why not Thomas? Why Peter, James, and John? Well, we notice uh, that he keeps taking Peter, James, and John into, into different spaces, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and, and so then there is a, the, the, the disciples that are 12, those that are three, and so Jesus keeps some that he had. And then out of that three, one, Peter. Right? But then out of that three, another one, John. So it's, it's, it's this grouping that, that Jesus is doing, right? What's another question? Why on the mountain? Why on the mountain? Right? Well, what do we know about Jesus and mountains? <laughs> he definitely died on one, on a mountain. Right? He preached on one, sermon on a mount. <laughs> but what else? What else did he do on the mount? Pray. He would leave them and he would go to his father. Now, now, asking the question reveals something. Okay. He would usually leave them and go to his father. So we know that on the mount something special happens. Whether it's the sermon on the mount, him being crucified on the mount, special things are happening on the mount. But this time, he's taking Peter, James, and John with him. Because there's a revelation for them to get. And if he's taking somebody else with him, think about this. You, we, we almost never get to hear what Jesus says when he's praying to the Father. We don't see those moments. But because he takes Peter, James, and John, they are witnesses and we are able to know what happened on that mount. Could it be that every time that Jesus went on the mount, that he was transfigured with the Lord? But we know that there were three witnesses in this moment. You see how these questions bring about some other things? So we know something special happens on the mount. Everybody say, something special happens there. Something special happens on the mount. Right, so he's taken... Yes. Moses goes there. Elijah goes there. Elijah's greatest victory happens. Okay, you get too, don't get too early. All right, verse 2. You're doing good. <laughs> but that's what it does. That's what the questions do. If, if you're, especially if you're reading scripture. Then you go back to another scripture. You grab something else. Now, look in verse 2. Verse 2 says, And when he was transfigured, and when he was transfigured before them, his face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as the light. Right? Now, what's a good question here? You got one. Yeah, why? Why, why did it happen? Right? Here's what I would add to that question. 
Where have I seen this before? Well, let's deal with it. Where have we seen it before? Moses. Okay, but why? Why did Moses go to the mount? He went to the mount to be closer to God. Okay, but then why was he shining like the light? Why was Moses? Because he was in the presence of God. Okay, now let's talk about this more. Now here's another question. So he was in the presence of God, but why was he shining? Right? No, 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 no. I'm talking about Moses. Why was Moses shining? Because he was in the presence of God. So he began. So then, if he was shining, right? Come on, there it is. Something he is absorbing so much of God that he is absorbing God's glory physically. What do we know happened next with Moses? He had to wear a veil. He's reflecting that glory. Why is he wearing a veil? Because the people couldn't look at him. The people couldn't look at him. Because when the people looked at him, what happened? Why were they scared? Because of the glory of God. What was happening with the glory of God when he was facing the people? It says, the Bible says his face was shining like the sun. Couldn't see. So even to see was painful. Mm hmm. To look at the light was was painful. And he was just the reflection. Mm -hmm. But now we see Jesus and this is happening again. Could it be that there's a, a greater connection here? Right? If there's a greater connection, what does that make us do? Look a little further. All right. So then let's take a look. In verse 3. And behold, who? Moses, Moses and Elijah. Elijah appeared where? To them, talking with, yeah. appeared to all of them, right. which means that Peter, James, and John also could see. Mm -hmm. You, you, you got to, I mean, you, think about this. They've already been amazed at the Messiah and seeing the miracles of the Messiah and absorbing who the Messiah is. They're learning this. He said, now let me take you up higher. And now he is glorified in a moment. And here's Moses. But here's the thing. The Jesus said, good morning, Moses. How did they know that was Moses? How did they know that was Elijah? Because of the light? <coughs> See, we, here's where we got to go with scripture. What do we know? What do we know about scripture when it comes to recognizing people in the glory of God? The Bible says we will be known as we are known. When we're glorified, we will be known as we were known. I've never seen any one of you. Not really. Come on in the room, everybody. <laughs> I've never actually seen who you really are. The essence, the fiber of who you are, breathed out of God's mouth. This is flesh. I've never seen you. So then how will I recognize your elder Ronnie when you don't have your flesh suit on any, anymore? Because we will be known as we are known. The knowing of the glory of God on the inside of me and the knowing of the glory of God on the inside of you and the spirit bearing witness that we're children of God, I, I'll know you. Because God knows you. And I'm looking through the lens of God. So in that moment, they appeared and they knew it was Moses because they're looking through the glory. Nobody had to tell them, that's Moses. Oh my goodness, that's Elijah. Isn't that amazing? And they're all floating. <laughs> right? I don't know, what is that? You know, is it like the twinkling and harps? And I, I don't, you know, what's the noise happening? You know, was there some white noise that was going on? I, what else was what else was going on? What, was there like you know, I don't know, right? Were there clothes floating in the air too? Was there a little bit of movement going? I don't know. I like to use my imagination. But there, there they were in glory, right? But now, here's the thing. I'm, I'm looking at this 
and I'm going. What's the? Oh, let me not. Let me not do it. I'll let you do it. What's the next question? How are they seeing it? How are they seeing it? Okay, because it just says they appeared, right? So then they are just revealed, right? They're revealed. Now, the mystery of revelation belongs to God, so God allowed it, right? But what else? What's another question? So why Moses, why Elijah? Was that? Why Moses? Why Elijah? Why Moses? Why Elijah? They were talking, to, and we don't know. Here's the thing. I wouldn't have known. I'd have been blown away that I couldn't. Could y'all start your conversation over again? I was, I was You know, that's how it would have been for me, right? But we don't know what, what they said. We know what God said, right? But, it, it, but they were talking to him, right? I want to tell you this. I'd like to present to you that there was a conference that was going on, Okay. But then now the question becomes, why Moses? Why Elijah? I wonder if it was only Moses and Elijah to be absent with the body uh -huh. and to be present with the Lord. Mm -hmm. So maybe there are plenty of people, but that's who they were able to see and they, who, who they were able to be aware of. Because it's definitely the ones that said that these appear to them. And so then, uh, you know, whoever, whoever, however, we don't know, right? But it's not, it's valid. It's valid. Uh, the Bible talks about being surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Now, some people put up on, on the fact that, that this is history. We're talking about history surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Some other scholars put it on the other, on the other end of it, right? That we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, right? But, but here's something I want to... To, to walk down, we're going to walk down your, the road of your question. There's three tabernacles that he wanted to do. Peter's speaking now, right? He says, it's good that we're here, right? Let us make one, three. Well, what's a tabernacle? A tent, right? But what does it represent? What's that? The presence of God, right? And what do you do in the presence of God? Mm-hmm. So then these tabernacles represent places of worship. Now, I want you to really understand this. He says, let us make three tabernacles. One for you, Jesus. One for Moses. One for Elijah. Let's make three places of worship. It's good that we're here. This, I understand. Peter, I understand what's happening. And he didn't. I understand what's happening. Let's make three tabernacles. This is how it's going to go. I understand the move of God now. This is where we got to be careful. Because we've seen something that God revealed to us. And Peter immediately began to form a doctrine. In the moment. Began to form a system. We've got to be careful about being in the presence of God. Receiving revelation and then putting it in our carnal mind and then starting a system when God is really saying something else. Right? How often did this happen? And we've seen it over the years, right? Okay, so there's Moses and Elijah. Now get this, this, get this idea. So, so let's, let's say it like uh, Moses comes down, per se. Right? I don't really consider heaven to be up. But Moses comes down. Now, now I'm messing with somebody's sensibility right there. Heaven is a spiritual place. You can't go up so far that you get there. Because depending on your perspective on the planet, you're up as somebody else is down. Everybody follow me? Heaven is a spiritual place. <laughs> All right, now let me move on from that. So let's say that Moses comes down. Well, we understand that Jesus was on the earth, but he comes up. Then Elijah's on the other end, and Elijah, what does he do? He comes down with Moses. And there is Moses, Elijah, and Jesus in the same spot. Right? Somewhere in the air. Okay? Now, this is, this is, let's talk about meaning now. When we're seeing Jesus with Moses and Elijah, 
Here's the question. What do Moses, Elijah, and Jesus represent? And why does God say, this is my beloved son, hear him. Hear him. Hold on. Moses, see this is how I go into this. This is why I love going to the study. If y'all saw me in the study, you would think this, you know, because I'll pace around and stuff and get excited and clap my hands all by myself. <laughs> but here's Moses, here's Elijah, here's Jesus. And God says, listen to him. Listen to him. Well, why send Moses? Why send Elijah? If you're going to say, listen to him. But Jesus is talking to Moses and Elijah. But God says to them, listen to Jesus. So now we talk about meaning. Not who is Moses, but what does Moses represent? The law. Moses represents the law. Well, well, hold on. If Moses represents the law, then Elijah has to represent something. The prophets. The prophets. Oh my goodness. So then now here then is the law and the prophets and God says, listen to him. Okay. Here's, this is what I love about scripture. Because if you keep asking questions, the Holy Spirit will just give you more and more. Right? All right. So then I want you to think about this. He says, listen to him, but they represent the law and the prophets. Well, Jesus talks about the law and the prophets. Ready? So let's go to Matthew chapter 7. Oh, we're doing pretty good. Matthew chapter 7, looking at verse 12. I'm going to read it before you get there. You better hurry up. Here it says, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the This is Moses and Elijah. Got it? Matthew 11, chapter 13. Matthew 11, 13. Here's what it says. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until who? John. The John he's talking about is who? John the Baptist. And if you're willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. I'm reading a little further. Verse 15. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus talking about the prophet and the law. Elijah, Moses. Now, look in Matthew 22. Let's keep on turning. Matthew 22, looking in verse 40 now. It says... There it is. And the second is like it. He's talking about the great uh, commandments. The first one, you shall, you shall love the Lord your God with uh, what? All your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. Right? Then verse 38, the, the, and this is the first and greatest commandment. Then verse 39, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 40 now is the one that we're quoting. On these two commandments hang what? All the Law and all Moses and Elijah. Got it? No, you don't. Let's go further. Okay, look. Luke 16. Luke 16. <laughs> this is why the Bible says you got to come as, come to a guy like a child. Luke 16, verse 16. Here's Jesus speaking again. You got to understand if Jesus is speaking and then he does something. And it represents what he said. He's, he's helping us make a connection. Verse 16, it says, The law and the what? Prophets were until who? John. This is amazing he says this. The law and prophets were until John. John, the Baptist. The law and the prophets were until John. Mm-hmm. The law and the prophets were until John. I, here, God reveals himself in relationship. Remember I told you that? He reveals himself in relationship. You know how we start counting time? Generations. Adam. Yeah. A person. 
Mm-hmm. That's how we start counting years. Adam. How does God reveal himself as the God of promise and covenant? I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. How does God then reveal the next phase of his plan? Saying the law and the prophets were until a person, John. Not a time, not a month. Not a date, a person. Then he says this, since that time the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. Everybody get that? The law and the prophets until John. One more step. Three more steps. Luke 24. Luke 24 verse 44. Luke 24, verse 44. He said to them, in verse 44, he, then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets. And, and then it says, and the Psalms. Concerning who? Amen. Me. And in me, not me, but Christ is eternal life. John 1 and 45 says, Philip and Nathanael said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. This is, this is what the disciples begin to say, right? Let's take it a step further. We're going to go to the Old Testament now. Go to Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18 fifth book in the Bible it says in verse where are we going verse 15 Moses speaking says the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from from your miss from your brethren him you shall hear him you shall hear Right? And then verse 16, according to all you desired of the Lord your God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see this great fire anymore, lest I die. He's talking about when God revealed himself on a mountain. In the mountain, there was thunders and lightning and fire and all of this, these things. And the children of Israel said, Well, we don't want any parts of this. Moses, you go talk to God for us. Right? But he's saying that there's going to come a prophet with a capital P speaking of Christ like unto me. And he says, you shall hear him. Now, if we fast forward to Matthew chapter 17, we find God saying, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. Confirming the word that Moses spoke in Deuteronomy 18. And here's Moses and Elijah. And there's a conference happening between the law, the prophets, and, and the word. Wait a minute. I thought the law, the law and the prophets was the word. But the law and the prophets talk about the word, but the word is a who. So you wrote down John 5, 39. You search the scriptures for them. You think you have eternal life. But these are they which testify of me. me. Yes. Hebrews chapter 1. Uh-huh. Verse 1. He says, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. Mm -hmm. But now. But now. Mm. God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance, and through the Son, He created the universe. The, the English Standard Version says, Whom He appointed the heir of all things. Yeah. Okay. yeah it's, the law and the prophets were till John. Mm -hmm. Now you get the word. Mm -hmm. Now you get the word. 
the law, think about this now. The law was written. The prophets spoken. But what about the word? Oh, it's lived. It's manifested. What else can we put there? It's revealed. Dem oh, y'all oh, got it now. You see how this works? Questions. It's the questions. If you can ask the questions, you get some stuff. The law was written. The prophets were spoken. But then now, until John, the law and the prophets, until John, and now we got the word, and the word is the word made flesh. De who said demonstrated? Demonstrated was good. Demonstrated, manifested, it's the word revealed, it's the word lived, and it's the word that it, he wants you to, you got to get past the letter into the spirit. Right? This, so here's what Jesus now begins to say, because he's the manifested, revealed word. He says, now... It, it was written that if you looked at some, if, if you, you commit an adultery, do not commit adultery, right? But if you do it, if you just look with lust in your heart, because he's saying, now this is about how you live it. How you live it. How it's manifesting in your life. That's got to be beyond something that you read, something that you say, but something that you live. He takes us all the way back to the garden and upsets the apple cart where we wanted to know the difference between good and evil. Am I doing the right thing? Am I doing the wrong thing? Am I doing the right thing? But Christ is life. God didn't want you to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He wanted you to get with life. Are you, are you understanding this? And while we're tripping over whether or not we're doing it right, Christ wants you to get to life. Life. They said he was doing it wrong. But he was doing life. Right? So he ate with the sinners and tax collectors because he was talking about life. Life. Right? Okay. So then, so then now, he, let's take it a step further. We know that Jesus uh, has a, two, two other titles. That he is the, uh, this is going to get real messy now. He's the author and what? Of what? Our faith. He's the author and finisher of our faith. So now I'm looking at the word meeting with the law and the prophets. The word is meeting with the law and the prophets. And if the word is meeting with the law and the prophets and they're having a conversation, what are they talking about? That part, I don't know. But I know that Jesus is both the author of the law and the prophets He's also the finisher of the law and the prophets. So then here's two words for you. He is the progenitor, meaning that he comes before, but he's also something else. F, U, L, fulfillment. Jesus then doesn't clip or burn or destroy the law, nor does he clip burn or destroy the prophets because why if he is the author why would he burn his work so he says not one jot not one tittle but it has to be fulfilled Jesus wants the law and the prophets fulfilled in our life like it was fulfilled in his life and he's there to help us to be able to live it to me it's like it's just more of an exercise of his love and his like desperation for us to get it mm -hmm. like, for his, his undying dedication and faithfulness for us I'm going to keep striving to, until I reach you until you get it and I'm going to keep, keep on so I'm going to give you the law I'm going to give you the prophet I'm going to keep going as far as I need mm -hmm. to go. That's just his love for us. Helen, stop there. What else does he give us? Holy I'll give you a Holy Spirit. <laughs> his Spirit. Right, yeah. And us up there. And angels. Mm -hmm. And us up there. Put you in a family of believers. Mm -hmm. Sure, you can share each other's strength. Mm -hmm. Trying to get you to life. 
giving us the will to do. Giving you the will to do and the faith to believe. <laughs> Isn't this good stuff? We're not done. So here's the thing. His face was shining like the sun. We talked about why that was. Well, that was about the veil, right? Well, wait a minute. Who wore the veil? Moses. And why did he wear the veil? Why did he wear it? Let's talk about it again. Why did he wear it? Yeah. Glory of God was on him. And so the veil was on so that he could speak to them. But Jesus, Jesus now, he, the veil is rent in his life. Right? So then the veil is rent from Moses. So the scripture tells us whenever the Old Testament is read, the veil is still there. Right? But then through the words of Christ, the veil is rent, is torn in two. Listen, y'all, you ready for this? Jesus is not just the word. But in the flesh, what else is he? He's the veil. He is the veil. Jesus is the veil over Moses' face. So then when Moses went with God, he would take the veil off so there's no separation. Then he would put the veil on to talk to the people. Jesus is the veil. His fle- Jesus is the word, excuse me. His flesh was the veil and it was rent. And when Jesus died, come on y'all to read your Bibles. What happened? The veil was torn. Why? Because Jesus' flesh was the veil. It was torn from top to bottom so they couldn't even sew it back up. And now if it's torn from top to bottom in the temple, that means there was no separation between the people and God. Mm Mm-hmm. He says, Peter, James, and I, I want you to see this. (laughs) I want you to see this. Look, I'm in the veil, right? And, and I got to be torn. I got to be torn in two. So Jesus is not the destroyer of the law and the prophets. He is the developer of the law and the prophets. And not just the developer, but he's also the development of the law and the prophets. Want to go a little further? Here we go. Okay. Matthew chapter 17 again. Let's go back. so excited I'm going the wrong way altogether. Matthew 17 we're going to start right back at verse 5 I think. Matthew 17 verse 5 here it is. It says for while while he was still speaking behold a bright cloud overshadowed them and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased hear him right? Listen listen listen, (laughs) listen to this. Oh my goodness. Verse 6, and when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly what? Afraid. Afraid. They'd never been afraid of Jesus' voice, but when God spoke, different level of authority. Then it says in verse 7, but Jesus came, listen, Jesus came and touched them and said, arise, do not be afraid. Listen, when they had lifted their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Okay. Are you seeing this? This is what I'll be doing like, at home. I'll be going, you know, I'll be, I'll be doing it. I'll walking around. Listen, there's, there'll be a circle of just like my, my footprints. Because when, before God spoke, they saw Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. Jesus representing the word that has to be lived, revealed, manifested, demonstrated the author and the finisher of all these things, the progenitor and the fulfillment of all these things. When they opened their eyes after God spoke, they saw Jesus only. Which means now this fell right into this. So when they opened their eyes again for the next level of the revelation, just the word just the word just the word the living breathing 
lively word. And that's not it. Look, in verse 8, and when they had lifted their eyes, okay, verse 9, uh, now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, tell the vision to no one until when? The Son of Man is risen from? You got a testimony, but I need you to hold it until it's ready to be revealed. Look at verse 10, and his disciples asked, saying, what then do the scribes say that Elijah must come, must come first? Jesus said, because uh, they, they're, they're trying to get this, but they got, they, got, they got scripture in their head. They're saying, why does they say Elijah has to come first, though? Okay, I, I think I see what we're seeing, but why do they say Elijah has to come first? Look in verse 11. Jesus answered and said to them, indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already. And they did not know him, but did, uh, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands because he knows his flesh is the veil. It's got to be torn. And it's got to be torn for all of us to be able to get to God. And Elijah is in John. John the Baptist is Elijah. Jesus said there is no greater prophet born to a woman than John the Baptist. Because he was the forerunner for Christ when everything changes. When the law and the prophets get fulfilled through the word. Through the word. Then it says, verse 13, Then the disciples understood that, that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. After, after that. Right? Uh, hmm. Can you handle a little, little bit more? Here we go. Here's where it gets really good. Now think about this. Moses and Elijah become the witnesses. They're the witnesses to the law. And they're the witnesses to the prophets, right? Okay. Go to Romans chapter 3 and 21. Well, you can write it down. I'm not going to read it to you right now. It says, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. When you see the law and the prophets, you see Moses and Elijah. And now Paul is saying being witnessed by the law and the prophets. And so then now you say, well, who's, who's Moses? Moses is the law. Who's Elijah? Elijah is the prophets, right? So the question now is this. Where have I seen this before? Where have I seen two witnesses? In Revelation. Who said that? Hey! Revelation, go there quickly. Revelation chapter 11, verse 1. Y'all got some endurance. You all right? You going to make it? You need to stand up and stretch? I think y'all are right. Y'all look like you're doing pretty good. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 1. Listen. Here it is. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the cord which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it was given to the Gentiles, and, and they shall tread the holy city. Well, am I reading too early? No, no, no. They shall tread the holy city underfoot for forty and two months. That's three and a half years. Then it says, And they will give power to, they will give, I will give power to my two witnesses. Two witnesses. My two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 uh, 60 days clothed in sackcloth. Again, that's three and a half years. If they're prophesying, and they're, this, is, this is about the future, and they're prophesying uh, about these things. And then here's what happens in verse 4. Uh, these are the two olive trees, the two lampstands standing. Now, that's the word, which is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. You get how this is? You see how it all comes together? And so then now the law and the prophets, these two witnesses, these two witnesses, now the question becomes, well, who's the two witnesses? The two witnesses that's going to come, that's going to do these things? If, any, if anyone uh, wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be uh, killed in this, this manner. These have power uh, 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 to shut heaven so that, so that no rain, so that no rain falls in the days, who else said this? Elijah. Fire coming down. Who's that? Moses. It's judgment. And it's coming from the law and the prophets. Here's your question. Here's what a mess with you. 
Why isn't it coming from the Word? What's that? But why did the law and prophets come back? If Jesus is fulfilled it, why did they come back? Why did they come back with fire and brimstone judgment? It's a fulfillment of the law. But why isn't Jesus there? What's that? They had to finish their testimony. But why wasn't Jesus back with them? <laughs> okay, y'all got deep. Back up. What chapter are we in? Revelation chapter 11. What has already happened? Already been raptured. Jesus has already come. The promise to take us with him has happened. What's left? The law and the prophets for those who wouldn't believe. Oh, so they're talking about, I thought they were just talking about judgment day. It's not. It is. Oh, okay. It's a part of what's coming. But now they have to finish their testimony. I heard somebody say that. They have to be the witnesses for what God had already said. But you and I have been rescued because we were in the word. And because Jesus gives you his Holy Spirit and he comes to rapture the world and he comes to get himself and you happen to have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. So then when Jesus comes back, then, then you then have to get caught up because the Holy Spirit is in stitch to your spirit. And you can't no more separation between you and God. So then Jesus comes to get himself. Are you getting this? Somebody say, I'm rescued. I'm rescued. rescued. Right? Let's take it a step further. Okay, here we go. Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. Because I want to I want to I want to rehearse this in front of you. So that you, when you get to this homework, you know exactly what to do, because this is what we're going to do over the next few weeks. Luke chapter 17, looking in verse 20. Luke chapter 17, looking in verse 20. Here's what it says. There's a lot of doctrine behind, you know, when does the rapture happen, you know, pre-trip, post-trip, you know, just listen, just listen to scripture. Verse 20 says, now when he, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God will come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come without, with, does not come with observation. Listen, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. Now, let's talk about kingdom business. That equates to how many dollars you got in, in the bank. That, my friends, can be seen. But Jesus says the kingdom of God is within you. Verse 22. Then he said to the disciples that uh, the days will come when you will desire to see one of uh, the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. Listen, and they will say to you, look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning flashes out of one part under heaven, shines to the other part under heaven. So, at, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. In the twinkling of an eye. Right? But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation, this generation. Listen. Now listen. Listen to what Jesus says. Listen to these words. It says, and as it was in the days of who? Noah. Okay. So as it will, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and devoured them all. Likewise, as it was in the days of who? Noah. This is interesting now. Then it says, they ate and they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, uh, they built. But on the day uh, that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so, will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed? Why does he mention Noah and Lot? See, that's the question I would want to know. Why does a comparison to Jesus coming and the day of judgment and all those things coincide and he uses Noah and he uses Lot. 
Why? Let's go to scripture. Genesis. <laughs> Look, we made it. We're already there. Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7, looking in verse 15. In Genesis chapter 7, verse 15, we find out uh, this. And they went into the ark. Who went into the ark? Noah, two by two, of all the flesh which is in the breath, uh, which is the breath of life. Listen. So they entered male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and, and the Lord shut him in. Who showed him in? The Lord. And then it started raining. Mm -hmm. What was the rain? I heard somebody say it. Rain was judgment. Mm -hmm. But before judgment came, the Lord they were rescued in the ark. Mm -hmm. The Lord shut them in. Mm -hmm. As it was in the days of Noah. Noah. That answers that whole question. We ain't got to deal with pre-trib and post-trib and if you believe this way or that way or mid-tribulation, just believe the scripture. You ain't got to put a name on it. You don't have to put a title on it. As it was in the days of Noah, the Lord shut him in, then it starts raining. The rain was the judgment. Genesis 19. It said the days of Lot, right? Talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, right? So here's, here's uh, Abraham, Abraham saying, you know, if there's 50, if there's 40, if there's 30, if there's 10, would you, would you, would you? Right? No, I'm not going to do it for them. Right? But you got to get them out of there. <laughs> I won't get them out of there. So in Genesis chapter 19, looking in verse 15, here's what the Bible says. It says, when the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot to what? Hurry. Hurry, saying, arise, take your wife and your two daughters who are with you, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. While he lingered, the men took hold of his hands, his wife hand and the hands of his two daughters the Lord being what? Merciful. Merciful him snatching them away was God's mercy and another word for the rapture is the snatching away he grabbed their hands and took him and that was mercy and it says and they brought him out and sent him outside the city now verse 22 it says Hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. I, Sodom and Gomorrah has to be destroyed, but I can't do anything until you're safe. Who would have ever thought the answer to the pre-trip, post-trip question could be found in the Old Testament? And over and over again. And Jesus then speaks of it and says, now go check Lot. Go check Noah. That's how it's going to be. Rescue first, then judgment. Yes. Everybody got that? Yes. Look at somebody and say, rescue, rescue. Then, judgment. then judgment. This was so embedded in what Jesus was teaching and his disciples. And I'm just going to read this to you. And we have made it. Okay. <laughs> And I'm going to read this to you in 2 Peter chapter 2. This, this is how embedded uh, this, this word was in his disciples. In 2 Peter chapter 2, uh, Peter is the one speaking. He's writing uh, letters to the churches. And he says, if I can get there. He says in chapter 2 of verse 4. Uh, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, judgment, uh, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of the eight people, a preacher, calls him a preacher of righteousness. Now, he was found drunk in a cave, but he was a preacher of righteousness. <laughs> but that's the difference between humanity and ministry. Mm -hmm. bringing in, in the flood of the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into what? Ashes. Condemn them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly and delivered who? Lot. No, no, not just Lot. Just 
Just Lot or Righteous Lot? Righteous Lot. Righteous Lot. Righteous lot. Righteous lot. Righteous lot. <laughs> now, I have to look at this. And the Bible calls him righteous. I could go look at his life and I say, oh, oh, oh. Or we could go look in David's life. But David was a man after God's own heart who God chose. And Jesus calls him by relationship, revealing himself as the Messiah, saying he's the son of David. The root and shoot of David. Righteous Lot who was oppressed. Lot was oppressed. Did you know that? Was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For the righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Peter goes back and talks about Lot and Noah while speaking of judgment. It wasn't a question for them when Christ was coming, oh, the events. There wasn't a debate. Not among the disciples. It wasn't a debate. Because they heard from the word. You know why we debate? Because we're not listening to the word. We're still looking for the law and the prophets. And dealing with that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And fighting amongst ourselves over things that the word has already addressed. And all we got to do is just live it. Come on, stand to your feet right there. All you got to do is just live. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six. I think I got it. I think I got it. So here's your homework. Your homework is simple. It's only five questions. See that? It's just five questions. 20 points apiece. You get one wrong, you got to see. No, I'm joking. Uh, I'm not going to grade you. But, they, <laughs> but here's what I want you to do. The directions are very simple. Read each question carefully and answer it using scripture in the space below the question. That's all you got to do. All right? I'm going to give you one right now. Maybe you can uh, see. Okay, you, you, I think you could get this one pretty easy. How is fear cast out? Perfect love. Now, forcing you to do this and to answer it with Scripture. That means you go back, you find that scripture, you write the scripture straight out. How is fear cast out? And then apply the scripture. That's, this is how that should be done. That forces you to get out of what you think and get out of what you feel. And just go with what the word says. You leave the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The law and the prophets fulfilled in the word. Deal with what the word says. That's what this is going to do. And we're going to do this for a while. You're going to keep getting one of these every week. I want to help you study. All right? I want to help you study. So then as you get these, you get those scriptures, okay? And as you get those scriptures, the other thing that you're going to do is take some time to write about what you found. Do, you know, some kind of thought map or something to be able to get some of these things out. All right? All right. Appreciate it. All right. So let's pray. Ready? Well, we thank you so much for tonight. We thank you for your wonderful word that you've given to us and how you have just blessed us so with the, just the reading of your word. Thank you for allowing us to ask questions of you. We don't question you, Lord, but we do come to you with questions. And we thank you that you're patient and you're merciful to answer our questions. We thank you for the, how the Holy Spirit met us right in the moment and helped us to understand more about you. Thank you for sending your son. Thank you for your word that you've given to us. Thank you that there is no more separation between us, your children, and you, our father. Thank you. Bless your people tonight. Give us traveling mercies. In Jesus' name.